in 2006, CNN published an article called Secrets of Greatness, How I Work, where they asked 12 famous and successful people how they organized their time. And they got some heavy hitters for it, like Marissa Meyer, who was at Google back then, Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, the designer Vera Wang, and even jazz legend Wynton Marsalis. All these highly accomplished people have, of course, worked long and hard to get where they are. So there's a lot of, I get up at 5 and arrive at the office at 6, or I take calls on the drive to the office, or I leave at 7 p.m. and then work a few more hours at home in the evening. But check out this reply. I know people expect someone like me to work a lot, but I feel I make better decisions when I'm well rested. So I usually get up at 8 in the morning after a good night's sleep, and I'll be in the office around 9.30. I try to stick to 40 hours a week and never work on the weekends. I have a life outside of work and a family who, I hope, likes having me around. And if I'm always in the office late in the evening, not to mention taking calls and writing emails all weekend, it sends a signal to my employees that this is what the company expects, that this is the right way. It isn't. It's a simple fact that the first 40 hours we work each week create much more value for the company than the next 20, 30, or 40. But those extra hours you spend at work hurt your productivity, your private life, and your health, which in turn harms the company. Frankly, if you can't organize your workload so it fits in a 40-hour week, you need to learn to prioritize and delegate. Wow, refreshing words. Now, here comes the quiz. Which of the 12 people interviewed for the article was that? Take a guess. Which of them said it? The answer is... None of them. Not one. I made it up. In fact, they all pretty much say the exact opposite. Marissa Meyer's day starts around 9 a.m. and meetings finish up around 8 p.m., after which she stays in the office to do action items and email. She brags about getting by on five hours of sleep, uh, but don't worry, it's not all bad for Marissa. She does pace herself by taking a whole week off every four months. Vera Wang says that her staff is always able to reach her, and A.G. Laffley, who was CEO of Procter & Gamble back then, is up in the morning at 5.30 and at his desk by 7, where he drives hard until about 7 p.m. Then he goes home, takes a break with his wife, and is back at it later that evening. You know, after reading a few of these replies, I fully expected one of them to go, I get up at 5 in the morning, half an hour before I go to bed, and work 27 hours a day, only stopping for a 30-second lunch break where two assistants stuff food down my throat like a foie gras goose. Not only do these people seem perversely proud to work insane hours, they want you to do the same. It is, they claim, the only way you will ever be successful. They're lying. As I'll show in this video, overwork is not only bad for you as a person, it actually hurts company profits. Now, of course, that article is from way back in 2006. I've linked it below so you can read it if you want. And one would hope that things have gotten better since then. One would be wrong. Jack Ma is the billionaire founder of Chinese tech company Alibaba, and in 2019, he praised the 996 rule, which is just a catchy name for an idea that's very popular in Chinese tech companies, that you must work from 9 in the morning to 9 in the evening, six days a week, if you want to have a successful career. For anyone doing the math, that's 72 hours of work a week. A typical commute is an hour each way in many countries. Throw that in the mix and your workdays start to look a little full. You'd have to get up at around 7.30 to be in the office at 9. You then leave the office at 9 in the evening and get home at 10. You probably want to be in bed by midnight since you have to get up at 7.30 again the next morning. So that means that six days a week, you have about two hours. Two hours for your partner, your kids, exercise, hobbies, 
family, friends, shopping, chores, housework, reading, music, walking the dog, and everything else in your life. But don't worry. You do get that one whole day off every single week. And sadly, I'm afraid that when that one glorious free day does come around, you're probably going to be too tired to enjoy it very much. Now, nevertheless, Jack Ma's belief in this rule is completely unshakable. And he said this, I personally think that 996 is a huge blessing. How do you achieve the success you want without paying extra effort and time? Um, he also added that you can only achieve business success by suffering and sacrificing. I'm going to return to this idea that success requires suffering in another video and argue that it's one, empirically just plain wrong, and two, being systematically used whenever people want to justify not changing a painful and unjust status quo. But let's park that topic for now and stick to overwork or I'll get totally sidetracked. I realize I may be wasting my time here by going up against a belief that is so prevalent among business leaders, but there is no way I can let this kind of nonsense pass and not point out exactly what's wrong with it. So there is this very widespread idea that if you want any kind of success in business, you must work crazy long hours. Some researchers talk about a culture of overwork, but I prefer to shorten that a bit and just call it the cult of overwork. Now, the formal definition of a cult is a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object. And while that definition is obviously not literally true in this case, I still think it fits. Like a cult, workaholics continue to believe in the myth that constant overwork is noble and the only path to success, no matter how much evidence you show them that they're wrong. Like a cult, their beliefs are not only wrong, they're actively harmful. We're very much coming to why that is. Like a cult, they promise that if you just believe their myth unquestioningly and go through a ton of suffering, then salvation awaits you on the other side, in this case, in the form of career success. Like a cult, they isolate you from friends and family, in this case, because you'll spend so much time away from them at work. And finally, very much like a cult, they're actively recruiting new members and are constantly trying to get others to buy into their beliefs and practices. But hey, at least they don't ring your doorbell like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Do you have a moment to talk about how an 80-hour work week is the path to salvation? Huh, I wonder who first got the idea of calling it the cult of overwork. Why don't we, why don't we Google that real quick? This looks like a promising search result. What's that? In software, the cult of overwork, a term coined by New Yorker contributor James Zerowicki, is rampant. And that article is from 2014, but I, wait, I could have sworn. Why don't we check my blog real quick? For the record, I honestly don't remember if I came up with the term on my own or if I saw it somewhere else. So in this video, we're going to look at how this cult became so widespread, exactly what's wrong with it, and what we can do about it, because I know we can fix it. In fact, I'll let you in on a secret the cult members don't want you to know. We are fixing it. They try to make it look like everybody's working more and more, and that this is perfectly normal and inevitable and in how we create more wealth. In fact, they need all of us to believe this or we wouldn't go along with it. But the truth is that working hours in most wealthy countries have been falling steadily for decades, even as wealth has increased. Not in all countries, though. Oh, America, I love you, but we should talk.
And tragically, many developing and poor countries currently have very high and increasing working hours. For instance, here's China. Damn you, Jack Ma. And just as many countries have reduced overwork, many workplaces, teams and individuals around the world have also managed to work their way out of the cult. So we have concrete proof that it can be done. I'll be sharing a ton of examples later. So not only are we currently fixing it, we've done it once before on a huge scale. Some time back, in workplaces all over the world, a passionate alliance of workers, scholars and activists managed to slash working times nearly in half. Here's how that happened. If you ever find yourself in Manchester, you have got to visit the Science and Industry Museum, which is not only brilliant, it's free, um, or you know, go there once travel is a thing again. The main focus of the museum is the Industrial Revolution, which had its epicenter in Manchester. And while I'm sure I had heard in school just how bad things were in factories back then, when I stood next to one of the actual cotton spinning machines and heard how 10-year-old children would crawl on their hands and knee knees underneath it while it operated to sweep up loose cotton for 12 hours a day, I got a whole new sense of just how badly workers were treated. How bad were things during the Industrial Revolution? Here's a short clip from a British documentary. Oh, and, and by the way, see if you recognize the voice of the narrator. But this constant pressure for productivity meant that factories could be very dangerous places. Workers were exhausted and corners were cut, which meant broken limbs and lost fingers were commonplace. The thick cotton dust in the air caused eye and lung infections, and the lack of sunlight from the long working days left children deformed with rickets. The average life expectancy of workers in industrial areas was just 32. That was indeed Sir Tony Robinson. Don't worry, Mr. B. I have a cunning plan to solve the problem. Better known as Baldrick from Blackadder. My favorite thing in the museum was this sign of the rules of the factory, which threatens workers with fines for a long number of infractions, including for swearing, for not washing themselves at least twice a week, or for being in the privy with another person. The worst offenses are punished not with a fine, but with firing. If you rocked the boat in any way, you were kicked out and 10 hungry people would be begging to take your place. The rules on this sign must not have been very popular, because the last rule is that you will be fired for damaging the sign. All of this matters because so much of what we take for granted in modern workplaces comes from industrial revolution factories. Huge corporations with specialized jobs and fixed working hours, that all comes from there. The very concept of a job where workers exchange their time for money did exist before, but was now practiced on an industrial scale, pun intended. The word manager came into the English language then, and the first org chart came from a railroad company in the 1850s. And another thing we got from the Industrial Revolution was long working hours. Before the Industrial Revolution, work was very different. Most people worked either on the family farm or in their own shops making shoes or pots or barrels. In pure numbers, it may seem like people back then worked about the same number of hours as we do today, but that work was structured very differently. A typical working day in the medieval period stretched from dawn to dusk, so 16 hours in summer and, and eight in winter, and that sounds long, but work was paused for breakfast, lunch, the customary afternoon nap, and dinner. Even back then, some people just couldn't stand this lax attitude to work, where people just took breaks whenever they wanted. Uh, James Pilkington, the Bishop of Durham, 
was definitely not a fan and wrote this sometime around 1570. The laboring man will take his rest long in the morning. A good piece of the day is spent afore he come at his work. Then he must have his breakfast, though he have not earned it, and at his accustomed hour, or else there is grudging and murmuring. At noon he must have his sleeping time. Then his bever in the afternoon, which spendeth a great part of the day. And when his hour cometh at night, at the first stroke of the clock, he casteth down his tools, leaveth his work, in what need or case soever the work standeth. Just to be clear, I am not trying to romanticize agrarian societies. Life was tough as hell back then, and I personally would not want to live without access to indoor plumbing and cute cat videos. I only mention this because I find that stuff fascinating as hell, and to show that high work hours are not some historic inevitability. And working hours were insanely long in the cotton factories. Men typically worked 14 hours a day, six days a week, and women and children worked only slightly less. Fortunately, things got better. Reformers and politicians worked to pass laws to regulate working hours, such as the 1833 Factory Act in Britain, which focused on child labor and said that children under nine years could not work in the factories, children of 9 to 13 years could work no more than 9 hours a day, and children of 13 to 18 years could work no more than 12 hours a day. Believe it or not, that was an improvement. Now, once the law passed, all the factory owners immediately realized that this made perfect sense, that conditions had been inhumane, and they happily followed the new rules. Yeah, I'm kidding. Um, they fought it tooth and nail every step of the way and did everything they could to circumvent the laws or have them struck down. They also whined and moaned and wrote angry letters to the editors saying that this was government interference in free enterprise, that prices on their products would surely go up and make them unaffordable to the public, and that they might have to close their factories as they could surely not be profitable without child labor. If any of that sounds familiar to you, you're right. This is the exact same song and dance we get from conservatives and business owners every single time anyone tries to improve worker conditions. We're seeing it right now in America, where the Biden administration is working to increase the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. The exact same arguments. It gets worse. In 1859, a man called Samuel Smiles wrote a bestseller called, and I really, really wish I was kidding about this, Self-Help. The book was called Self-Help. And in it, he wrote that anyone who worked hard and practiced thrift and self-discipline would succeed and become wealthy. He also claimed that poverty and misfortune were just your own damn fault and that governments should never provide welfare or regulate private companies. That's the cult of overwork right there. Samuel Smiles' book is the 1850s equivalent of billionaires today telling struggling young people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and stop wasting money on avocado toasts and lattes. Despite all of this resistance, things got better. In addition to new laws, it also took massive demonstrations and literal fights with the police and sometimes even the army who were deployed on the side of factory owners. But the result was a remarkable drop in working hours from the 1800s to about 1950. Everyone was expecting this trend to continue. The economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that by 2030, the average work week would be just 15 hours. Yeah, that didn't happen, though it still could. In his book, Utopia for Realists, Dutch historian Rutger Bregman argues very convincingly that we can still achieve that goal. Rutger Bregman, that sounds familiar somehow. Where have I heard that name before? Oh yeah, he was the guy who had the absolute courage to crash the billionaire's clubhouse at Davos and say this. 
But then, I mean, almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters, mm -hmm. fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's, we gotta be talking about taxes. Yeah, exactly. That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. Even if you don't agree that a 15 hour work week is attainable, we should still do everything we can to reduce or eliminate overwork because overwork is bad. It was bad in the Manchester factories and it's bad now. And I don't think most people realize just how bad it is. Let's look at why. If we want to figure out exactly how the cult of overwork is wrong, we clearly can't trust the cult members themselves because they say things like this. You can forget lunch breaks. You can't make money for a company while you're eating lunch. If you don't put in the hours, someone just as smart and clever as you will. Fact of life, the strong survive. If you ignore this, you might just end up as roadkill, lying dead by the side of the corporate highway as others drive right past you. This is from a horrible book called You Can't Win a Fight with Your Boss by Tom Marker. The title alone should tell you just how bad that book is. We also shouldn't just trust our own gut feeling. I think there's only one way to go here. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. And we're in luck, because there is a tremendous amount of science we can look at on the effects of overwork. This sums it up pretty well. Considerable evidence shows that overwork hurts us and the companies we work for. I know what you're thinking. What kind of goddamn radical postmodern neo-Marxist academics came up with this? And I can tell you, it was the goddamn radical postmodern neo-Marxist academics over at Harvard Business Review. That's right. One of the world's leading management magazines from one of the world's leading business schools concluded that overwork sucks. Let's count the ways in which it sucks, starting with the big one, profits. And by the way, I'll be giving citations to the research papers I use every step of the way, so you know that all of this is proven. You can also find all of these references in the video description. So, do companies where employees routinely overwork make more money? That'd be a big fat nope. Why not? It's really not a, it's not a big mystery. We get tired. And as people get tired, they lose cognitive capacity, which means that overworked people are less productive, less creative, make more mistakes, have more accidents in the workplace, make worse decisions, are less likely to help each other, and are dumber. Yes, that last one is true. Overwork makes you dumber. A study of British government workers found that those who worked 55 hours a week scored lower on various cognitive tests than their co-workers who worked 40 hours a week. Before we go on, we should pause to make clear the distinction between productivity and output. Output is how much work a given person or team or company produces. A certain number of widgets produced in a factory or lines of code written in a tech company, for instance. Productivity is simply output per time unit. So how much gets produced per hour, day, week, or whatever. And, and many people accept that a person who works 80 hours a week will probably be less productive than one working 40. They intuitively get that the last 40 hours are probably going to be less effective than the first 40. But what most people don't know is that productivity actually drops so much for people working more than about 50 hours a week for all of the reasons we just saw that their total output is lower, not just their productivity. And this is true for both factory workers and knowledge workers. It's not just a matter of diminishing returns on the extra hours. There's a negative return on those hours and the company is overall less profitable. And this is not news. During World War I, 
the British army needed. Munitions, munitions and more munitions. They desperately wanted to maximize the output of their munitions factories. And at first they tried to make workers work more, up to 90 or even 100 hours a week. But when that mysteriously didn't work, they started collecting data, connecting working hours to output and found something very curious. This graph shows actual output, so not productivity, versus hours worked for two groups of women workers doing two different kinds of tasks. As you can see, beyond a certain number of hours, in, in this case 51 a week, working more hours did not increase output. Every hour worked after that was essentially wasted. We have known this since 19 frickin' 17. This effect has been found again and again in many different studies from both factory settings and office settings. One team of game developers were trying to finish a game on a deadline, so they moved from 40 hour work weeks to 60. 10 hours a day, 6 days a week. They found that they did indeed get more work done for the first 3 weeks, but after 4 weeks total output fell. Their productivity had fallen so much that they were now working more while accomplishing less. And even though overworking your employees doesn't increase output, it can actually increase costs because maybe more employees get sick or quit the workplace and have to be replaced, which is costly. So overwork is no bueno for the workplace, but it's also very bad for people. Studies show that permanent overwork is connected with a long list of mental and physical health problems, including all of these. For instance, people who work more than 55 hours a week have a 33% increased risk of getting a stroke. I think the impaired sleep thing is kind of interesting because research also shows that bosses who haven't slept well are more likely to abuse their staff. Remember Marissa Meyer bragging about getting by on five hours of sleep? You gotta wonder how her employees were getting by. <laughs> also, studies show that 15% of Americans believe they can get by on less than six hours of sleep a night, but only one in 20 are correct. The rest are, we can only assume, sleepy assholes. Yet another problem is that while people can be pressured to be in the office for 12 hours a day, there's just no way they're working productively 12 hours a day. This leads to a ton of ass time, that is unproductive time, where your ass is in your office chair, but no real work is getting done until the light finally turns off in your boss's office and you can go home. This is deeply frustrating because not only is that time taken away from the rest of your life, that time is wasted. And you know it's wasted and nobody likes to waste time. Another problem with overwork is that it has an inherent gender bias. It forces people to choose between work and family. And even if the company offers any kind of concessions to personal life like parental leave or you know, letting you leave early to pick up your kids, those who take those concessions are seen as uncommitted and their careers are derailed. And that ends up hurting women's careers much more often than men's. More broadly, the cult of overwork exploits vulnerable groups. Undocumented immigrants may be pressured into taking unpaid overwork under the threat that if they don't, they'll be reported to immigration authorities and possibly deported. Unskilled workers in areas with high unemployment may be pressured into long working hours under the threat of being fired. And, and older employees who often find it harder to find a new job because of ageism can be pressured into overwork for the same reasons. And the final problem I'll mention with the cult of overwork is that it's meaningless and unjust because it rewards those who work a lot instead of doing the obviously fair thing and reward those who work well, those who do a good job. How unfair is it? <laughs> One study found that managers couldn't actually tell the difference between those of their employees who did work 80 hours a week and those who just pretended to. Both of those groups were rewarded. But you know what managers could do? What they could do was identify and punish employees who were open about working less. Even though there was no evidence that those employees accomplished less or any sign that the overworking employees accomplished 
more. Imagine what it must feel like to work 40 hours a week and do great work, but get passed over for promotions again and again in favor of coworkers whose output is no better than yours, but who work 80 hours a week. Or even worse, seeing the rewards go to coworkers you know are only pretending to work that much. Oh, and going back to the gender bias, this effect hurts women more. The same Harvard study found that women who didn't buy into the cult of overwork were more likely to openly choose to work less and consequently were marginalized within the firm. Men who didn't want to work 80 hours a week were more likely to find ways to cheat and make it look like they did and therefore were not punished. I don't know about you, but I have a thing about unfairness. I, I can't stand it and this is just plain wrong. So these are some of the main reasons why the cult of overwork sucks. It just doesn't suck. It's also dumb, idiotic, stupid, moronic, and ridiculous. But hold on a minute. Hold on. If all of these successful people that CNN celebrated work long hours, doesn't that mean that long hours make you successful? No, it actually doesn't. Let's look at why. The workaholics of the world won't shut up about how good and noble and necessary overwork is, but that doesn't mean they're right. First of all, the cult members themselves aren't exactly the most reliable witnesses here and may be straight up lying or just fooling themselves. In a culture where long hours are venerated, there is huge pressure on them to inflate the amount of hours they say they work either to stroke their own egos or to try to manipulate their employees to work more. And studies do actually show that people notoriously overestimate their own working hours. Also, you know, they believe all those extra hours made them successful. That doesn't mean it's true. Look at it from their side. They've worked 80 hour weeks for decades and made huge sacrifices in other areas of their lives. Imagine what it would cost them psychologically to have to admit that, yeah, I could probably have achieved pretty much the same results working 40 hours a week and still had a life. All of that extra time I spent at work was just wasted. That would be a massive blow for them, especially since they've based so much of their identity and self-worth on their ability to work more than others. So it probably won't surprise you to hear that studies show that people who work long hours overestimate their own productivity and underestimate the negative health effects of war overwork. They kind of have to, right? So no wonder these people can't break out of the cult. Well, actually some of them do. Though it's usually the ones that eventually have some sort of mental or physical breakdown. Lying in a hospital bed and looking at the sutures from a quadruple bypass, some of them do have an awakening about the real cost of all that time they spent at work. But, you know, well, why wait until then? And beyond all that, we can't trust all of these stories of long hours leading to success because there is a massive reporting bias. Let's make a chart. You have people who work all those extra hours and people who don't. Then you have people who achieve success, however we define that, and people who don't. Man, I love a good four-quadrant model. Traditional thinking has it that everyone is in one of these two squares. Down here, you have your regular humdrum worker bees working 40 hours a week, who will of course never amount to much of anything and never be very successful. But up here, you have the stars of the modern workplace who are committed and put in the hours and who get all the rewards. Those other two squares, eh, don't worry about it. There's no one there, not a soul, completely empty. This is such obvious nonsense that I shouldn't even have to address it. Story of my life, let's do it anyway. In this box, we have all the people who worked super hard, but were somehow mysteriously not successful. Like the female executive who put in longer hours than any of her male competitors 
but was still passed over for a promotion because sexism is a thing. Or the hardworking management consultant who was perfectly on track to get that partnership and then died from a heart attack. Or the tech founder who worked night and day on the startup but still never got funding for it. Or the super talented young game developer working 90 hours a week who was laid off when his workplace was bought by a much bigger competitor and they started downsizing. Do you know someone who worked really hard and did not get that payoff? This is them. Ignoring these people while yelling to the skies about all the successful workaholics is a textbook example of survivorship bias. That's the logical error of concentrating on the people that made it past some selection process and overlooking those that did not, typically because of their lack of visibility. There are about a million ways that working long hours will end up not paying off, but we don't like to think about that because we prefer to pretend that we're 100% in control of our careers. We ain't, and the huge number of people who end up in this square proves it. And then in, in this square up here, we have all the people who have become truly successful without working overtime. What's that? You've never heard of any? That's kind of curious, isn't it? It's almost as if their stories don't fit the preconceived narrative in business orthodoxy. And so those stories don't get told. But there are a ton of them. Let me give you three. Yvonne Chouinard started Patagonia because he needed money to go rock climbing. In the beginning, he'd close shop whenever he had enough cash and open back up again when he ran out. This approach has stayed with him and he usually leaves the office at 3 p.m. When he's even in the office, he spends much of the year in Wyoming where he only calls into work maybe twice a week. Patagonia has many innovative ways to keep work hours in check, including my favorite, the surf rule. Their HQ is near a beach in California, and the rule is that whenever the waves are good, you can leave whatever you're doing at work and go surfing. They even have surfboards for you to use in the reception. Fred Gratson describes himself as the laziest man in North America, and yet he has started several successful companies, including an ice cream company and a telecommunications group. He wrote a book called The Lazy Way to Success, where he explains his belief that success is inversely proportional to hard work and that if it feels like work, you're doing it wrong. Henrik Rosendahl, a CEO of the Danish design company Rosendahl, deliberately keeps his work week at 40 hours and never leaves work later than 4.30, even if that means getting up and, and walking out in the middle of a meeting. He used to be the kind of boss who worked late into the night and responded to emails around the clock. But then he realized that if he couldn't do his work inside normal hours, it had to be because he wasn't good enough at delegating and prioritizing. This picture of Henrik with two of his kids and a bike trailer will probably be the most Danish thing you see this week. According to the cultists, these people should not exist because they debunk their myth. The cult promises two things. One, if you work hard, success will follow. And two, success will only come if you work long hours. As we have clearly seen, both of these promises are false. Now, does that mean there are no benefits to long hours? I found one study that showed that long hours can boost your career, but it ain't exactly magnificent. Um, the results imply that when hours exceed 47, five extra hours per week are associated with 1% increase in annual wage growth. So if I'm reading that correctly, it means that going from 40 to 47 hours gets you nothing, while every five hours on top of that gets you 1% more than those working only 40 hours. And that, by the way, the study said that's mostly if you're young and highly educated. Color me unimpressed. So I'm not saying there are no advantages to buying into the cult of overwork. In certain workplaces and in certain industries, it may be the price of admission and the only way to get ahead. But I am saying that whatever benefits you might get from all that extra work, it will be limited and uncertain 
and come at a very high cost in all other areas of your life. And also, whatever raises and promotions you might get out of it are not because you're actually any better at your job or created more value for the organization. The research clearly shows that permanent overwork only makes you less productive. No, you only got those pats on the head over your rivals at work because you are the one most willing to buy into a bullshit belief system and the one who sacrificed the most of your private life to it. Kind of like how cult members are rewarded for having the strongest faith and for sacrificing the most to the cult. Some people think, I can do this for a few years while I'm still young and have no commitments and then I can scale back the hours and maybe you can. But you might also end up sick and burned out or worse, you might end up buying into the system through a vicious cycle of abusive treatment and conspicuous consumption. And even if you manage to successfully game the system by faking an 80 hour work week like the consultants we heard about earlier and getting all the rewards, you would still be perpetuating the system and working actively to keep it in place so it can hurt new people coming into your field. So there is zero doubt that all of this overwork sucks. It's hurting our work lives and our private lives and it even lowers our work performance. Which raises the question, why the hell do we still have it? Let's look at that. I think this video has gone a little too long without a quote from some idiot who's in love with overwork and wants you to be too. You know, just to remind ourselves of what we are up against here. The only problem is there are so many to choose from. Who should we go for? I, oh, I got it. Let's take this one from Michael Bloomberg, the genius who spent half a billion dollars getting absolutely nowhere in the 2020 Democratic primary. I, I'm not smarter than anybody else, but I can outwork you. And uh, my key to success for you or for anybody else is make sure you're the first one in there every day and the last one to leave. Don't ever take a lunch break or go to the bathroom. You keep working. But what if that opportunity comes along and you blow it because you haven't been to the bathroom all day so you end up wetting your pants in the middle of the meeting? You can't just put in the hours. Sleeping in the office or skipping lunch breaks or bathroom breaks does not make you a hero. It makes you a chump. So if the cult of overwork led by people like Bloomberg and Jack Ma is so wrong, and as we saw previously, research shows that it's bad for people and bad for business, why is it still around? I'm not the only one to wonder about that. Uh, John Pensavel, who wrote the seminal article on the productivity of munition workers that we talked about earlier, has clear evidence that overwork sucks, but corporations aren't listening. Um, he said, why don't we observe more employers doing this, i.e. experimenting with different hours? I don't know why they don't. Don't worry, John. I've got you. Let's look at some of the main reasons why overwork still dominates in so many workplaces. Technology is definitely a main driver. It's a very common observation that work used to take place in the workplace inside working hours, but with laptops and mobile phones and emails, now many jobs can be done from anywhere at any time. And I can't tell you how many people I've seen at holiday resorts around the world working on a laptop by the pool while their kids played. With all this tech also came an expectation that some workers should be constantly available to clients. By the way, many of those clients may be suffering from the same pressures themselves. It also doesn't help that the world has now seen three major recessions on top of each other in 20 years due to the dot-com bust, the global financial crisis, and now COVID. When the economy is bad, many companies use the tough times as an excuse to lay off large numbers of employees while, of course, expecting the remaining workers to do the same amount of work with now fewer people. Hello, Peter. What's happening? Um, I'm going to need you to go ahead and come in tomorrow. Oh, oh, and I almost forgot. Uh, 
I'm also gonna need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday, too, okay? We uh, lost some people this week, and uh, we need to sort of play catch-up. Thanks. And when unemployment is high, it's easier for companies to exploit their employees because they have fewer options to escape for better conditions elsewhere. Another economic driver is the short-term profit demands placed on many corporations, especially those on the stock market. If they can't deliver profits and growth that live up to analysts' expectations every single quarter, then the stock price will drop and the CEO's compensation will likely suffer. This makes companies much more likely to make choices that are profitable now, even though they will cost them money later. And deliberate understaffing is a classic example that I've seen in so many organizations. The cult of overwork is also nourished by the fact that work hours are easily visible to bosses, but work output may not be, especially for knowledge workers. This can lead bad bosses to obsess over what they can see and measure, i.e. how many hours people are in the office, instead of focusing on what matters, which is clear to the amount of work employees get done. This may also explain why so many companies are against letting people work from home, even though all the available research shows that knowledge workers are more productive when they have the option of working from home. COVID has now forced a lot of them to give people the option to work from home. And somehow, mysteriously, workplaces did not completely collapse. We all need to make sure that that doesn't get taken away from us once the virus is under control. I would like for at least one positive thing to come out of this whole pandemic, okay? It also seems to me like we start to indoctrinate our kids for overwork starting in schools. Again, this varies from country to country, but in many places, children have long school days and a ton of homework on top of that. Chinese schools are infamous in, in this regard. And, and who is rewarded in this type of school? It's the child who shows up for all the classes, does all their homework, listens attentively to the teacher and never rebels against any of this. Oh, and here's a fun fact. Just like we have evidence that long working hours don't improve productivity, there is also a buttload of evidence that long school days do not lead to better academic performance and that homework has no positive effect on children's learning. Now, given all of this, it, it seems to me that we train kids from a young age to do two things, work long hours and accept bullshit unquestioningly, which does position them perfectly for a life in the cult of overwork. Another factor are all of these articles and videos and biographies and motivational quotes and fawning interviews that glorify overwork. You have to put in the hours, they say. You gotta hustle. Put your shoulder to the wheel and your nose to the grindstone, but never the other way around. Do the work. Success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Make the sacrifice, never give up. You have to pay your dues. See the 10 secrets of successful people. You won't believe number four. It's working long hours. And somehow, be born to rich parents never makes the list of top 10 secrets of famous successful people. All of this is meant to glorify the grind. And there is so much of it. I call it grind porn. And whatever you do, do not Google that term, okay? Okay. One of the most famous examples of grind porn is Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule, which he presented in his book, Outlier, claiming that if you wanted to be world-class at something, you just had to grind out the hours, in this case, 10,000 of them. It is perfectly in character for the true believers in the cult of overwork that they still love this rule, even though it has been repeatedly debunked. Another reason that the cult of overwork is everywhere is that it becomes self-perpetuating inside a company. When the managers are true believers, they of course only promote other workaholics to management positions, and anyone who wants to have a life is marginalized career-wise. This keeps the system in place for the next generations. There are also some bosses that just don't want to make it easy for younger people. I paid my dues, I put in the hours, why should the young people today have it easy, they say. This is scarily similar to the hazing rituals you see in frats, sport teams, or military units, 
where new members are put through activities that are humiliating, dangerous, or abusive before they can join. New members may hate these activities, but once they're accepted into the group, they often end up enthusiastically doing the same to the next batch of new members. Interestingly, research shows that hazing can reinforce status hierarchies and build loyalty, discipline, and conformity so group members are more likely to do as they're told and more likely to sacrifice their own goals and well-being for the organization. Does that sound like something a bad workplace might want? Maybe they start by selling you on the virtues of overwork, but once you've swallowed that, it might be easier to get you to go along with, let's say, sexist treatment of women, marginalizing minority groups, polluting the environment, siphoning profits off to a tax haven in the Cayman Islands, or swindling customers. Forcing people to overwork early in their career would help an organization keep out independent-minded people. You have to go along with all the overwork to get promotions. So who will not get a promotion? Anyone willing to go against prevailing beliefs? Anyone who puts their life ahead of their job? And anyone who has the courage to say no? Basically, it serves to filter out troublemakers and people with lives. Enron would be a classic example of this. They created a system of overwork and rewards that got employees to commit financial fraud and to joke about it among themselves. So, so the rumor's true? They're fucking taking all the money back from you guys? All the money you guys stole from those poor grandmothers of California? <laughs> yeah, Grandma Millie, man. So she's the one who couldn't figure out how to fucking vote on the butterfly ballot. Yeah, yeah. now she wants her fucking money back for all the power you charged right up, jammed right up her ass for fucking $250 a megawatt hour. <laughs> <laughs> Are corporations actually using massive amounts of overwork to get rid of independent-minded people early? If you're thinking this is getting a little tinfoil hatty, don't worry, it's gonna get way worse. I have a couple of actual conspiracy theories about overwork for you in just a second. There is no denying that raises, bonuses, and promotions are very alluring and addictive. First of all, they're tangible and visible in a way that your actual work may not be. Also, they serve to raise your status among your peers, something we're all conditioned to like, both biologically and socially. Which is precisely why companies dangle these kinds of carrots in front of people whenever they need them to do something that's dumb or wrong. And of course, the longer you've overworked, the harder it is to stop because you've worked so hard and sacrificed so much for so long. Giving up now would mean that all of that was for nothing, and that's the sunk cost fallacy in action. In some industries, the overwork lifestyle is coupled with conspicuous consumption. Stockbrokers with Ferraris and Rolexes would be the perfect example. You've seen the Wolf of Wall Street, right? And now you're stuck because you have to bring in even more money every month to keep up all of that spending. I want to mention two more reasons why the cult of overwork is still around, even though it is very, very wrong. But now we're going deep into conspiracy theory country. Some people have suggested that corporations and politicians conspire to keep working hours high to make sure workers don't have the time and energy to think about their conditions and revolt against the system. Now, Honestly, I don't personally believe that anyone in government or business has ever sat down and deliberately planned this out, but it might very well still have that effect. A worker who comes home after a 12-hour workday may just be too tired to do anything but re-re-re-rewatch episodes of The Office, a show that, by the way, seems designed to reinforce the idea that work sucks. A worker with a 40-hour work week might more easily find time for dangerous activities like reading books, watching YouTube videos about the call of overwork, or discussing their situation with other people and planning what to do about it. And if you want to get really conspiratorial, <laughs> I 
there's another theory that governments and corporations keep working hours high so that workers will buy younger so they can spend less money on pensions and health care for old people. And while some would say that the ideal citizen is the one who works hard all their life and then drops dead the day after their retirement, I really doubt if any corporation or country has ever done this as a deliberate design choice. Or at least I really, 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 really hope not. Really, 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 really. Check this, go through this video, I'll take. And they go, that's it. Yeah, it's fine, okay. Oh, stop. There's another... My hat keeps falling off. <laughs> There's another... <laughs> So given that there are all of these forces keeping the cult of overwork alive, do we have a hope in hell of fixing it? Of course we do. As we saw earlier, many countries are fixing overwork and many workplaces have started doing the same. Here's a fascinating example of a really cutting edge, forward thinking, super creative, highly modern, totally groundbreaking solution from <clears throat> 1930. During the Great Depression, Kellogg's owner, W.K. Kellogg, tried something radical. Instead of firing unneeded staff, they switched everyone to a six hour workday on December 1st, 1930, at slightly lower salaries. This has been described best by the historian Benjamin Honeycutt, who's a professor at the University of Iowa. For his book, Kellogg's Six-Hour Day, he interviewed many Kellogg's workers from back then and found that they loved the new hours. They were happy to help keep others employed, and many of them also reminisce about how they used their new free time visiting friends over beer or coffee, participating in amateur sports, hunting and fishing, or doing family things together like gardening, canning, and school projects. By the way, Honeycutt thinks that W.K. Kellogg was driven to try this because he had previously worked for his older brother John Harvey Kellogg. Yes, that weirdo who led an anti-masturbation movement and circumcised himself at the age of 37. Honeycutt writes that John Harvey worked WK nearly to death to the point where he became deeply unhappy and unable to enjoy life. And maybe that's why he wanted to help others have free time and enjoy their lives more. One more, by the way. Kellogg was inspired to introduce the six hour workday by a book from a British industrialist, Lord William Liverhume, called The Six Hour Day and Other Industrial Questions, a book that was published in 19 freaking 19. And while the story from Kellogg shows how shorter work days can absolutely work, the story also shows how easy it is to lose it. In 1937, W.K. Kellogg stepped back from running the company and the new leadership immediately started undermining the six-hour workday. And they succeeded! Management lured workers with higher pay, yes, but they also started to paint the shorter workdays as feminine, making some male workers embarrassed to work less than men in other companies. Slowly but surely, over the following decades, one team after another voted to go back to eight hours a day. The last team went back in 1985. And I think this story shows us that fixing individual workplaces is good, but it's not enough because leadership can change and the hard-won benefits can go up in smoke. We need more comprehensive solutions. We are going to have to fix this on three levels, the society, the company, and the individual. 
none of these are going to be enough alone. We, we need all three. Let's look at the national level first. As I said in the beginning, many countries have fixed it and are still fixing it. Working hours in Germany have been reduced by more than one third since 1950. How does that kind of thing happen? There is no one answer. It takes things like strong worker protections through appropriate laws, minimum wages so people can actually live on regular working hours, and support for unions to collectively bargain on behalf of workers. All of this requires politicians who will pass these types of laws and enforce them. For instance, China has laws against something like the 996 rule. They're just not enforced. And when Trump was president, he packed many of the government agencies that were supposed to enforce these laws with cronies who turned a blind eye to companies who broke the rules. Quite simply, we need politicians who are on the side of workers like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who recently missed Biden's inauguration because she was on a picket line in the Bronx with workers who are on strike for better pay and got it. The country with the lowest working hours is my country, Denmark. I am actually super proud that Denmark is last on that list. And this is partly because we do have very strict laws protecting worker rights, um, which in my opinion is one of the reasons why Danish employees are some of the happiest and most productive in the world. But it also happened because Danish workers chose it in Denmark. Trade unions and employer organizations renegotiate working conditions every three years. And in many, many cases, workers have actually chosen lower working hours and more vacation time over higher wages in these negotiations. We can even look beyond just regulating work time. The European Union is currently drafting laws that will guarantee a worker's right to disconnect so that companies cannot coerce you to always be available on phone or email. And maybe one of the most promising interventions would be a universal basic income. Remember that book I mentioned earlier by Rutger Bregman? Texas, Texas, Texas. In the book, he makes a very strong case for just giving everybody money and argues that every time it's been tested, it's worked wonders for people and society. And one outcome is that people at lower income levels don't have to work two or three jobs to survive. Universal basic income is a whole topic on its own. I'll link to some great videos in the description where you can learn more about it. The problem is that action at a societal level cannot stand alone because company culture can still pressure employees to work more. Even in Denmark, we have workplaces that are infamous for having an overwork culture. So companies need to fix it as well. And there are so many examples of organizations all over the world that have successfully ended the cult of overwork for their people. Seattle-based tech company Valve have put their entire employee handbook online and it is the most awesome thing ever. In it, they say a lot of great things, including this about overwork. While people occasionally choose to push themselves to work some extra hours, at times when something big is going out the door. For the most part, working overtime for extended periods indicates a fundamental failure in planning or communication. At Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor, Michigan, they work 40 hours a week and never overwork. Their CEO, Richard Sheridan, put it like this when I visited a few years ago. In 12 years, we've worked 40 hour work weeks. We've never worked weekends. We've never had a deny or delay a vacation request. All of our clients are external to our organization. They all have their budgetary and scheduled deadlines, but we've constructed a system that if we need to get more done to hit a deadline, we can actually add in more people to help and actually get more done. You should absolutely read his book, Joy Inc where he describes the awesome company culture they've created. And before you accuse me of having only American examples, let me tell you about Vega IT in Novi Sad, the third biggest city in Serbia. They have 250 employees doing software development projects for clients. 
and have also decided to minimize overwork as much as possible. And of course, sometimes there's a deadline on a customer project, so they have to work a little extra. Their CEO, Sasha Popovich, told me that last month, the entire company had only 150 overtime hours. That's less than one per person. Interestingly, some of their clients don't approve of this and try to pressure them to make their employees work longer hours so they can finish projects faster. But the answer is always no. And Danish training company Hartmann's, which has won awards for offering the best work-life balance in the country, realized that their trainers deliver the best work when they're not overworked. Interestingly, part of their journey was for their CEO, Anime Raun, to scale back her workload and stop emailing people outside of normal working hours because she found it pressured them subconsciously to work more, even though that was never her intention. So companies can definitely do great things to end overwork and have been doing it for over a hundred years. But while we definitely need action from our nations and corporations, each and every one of us also needs to do what we can to cope with overwork. If you're working too much and feeling stressed, have you tried doing a mindfulness meditation combined with an essential oil diffuser? I mention this not because it works, but because this is the type of advice you most often get from coaches, gurus, and workplaces on how to deal with overwork. And I think the reason why this type of advice is so popular is because it requires nothing of the company. It puts the burden on all of us to learn how to live with high workloads. And also, it, it sounds like an easy fix, doesn't it? No need for tough questions like, am I in the wrong industry? Or is society currently structured so that all my hard work only serves to further enrich the already obscenely wealthy? Changing societies and workplaces takes time. And, and what can you do in the meanwhile if you're currently killing yourself working 80-hour weeks? People can so easily become willing enablers of the cult of overwork. I have no source for this story, so take it with a grain of salt. But a manager working in Japan once shared it with me, and I have no reason to believe he's lying. Now, of course, Japan has a very powerful culture of overwork. There's even a word in Japanese called karoshi, meaning death from overwork. Now, the government is trying to pass laws to reduce overwork, but Japanese employees are so habituated to working long hours that they are actively resisting those measures. This manager told me that the company put a lock on the entry to the building and employees now had to swipe their ID cards for the doors to open so the company could register when they came and when they left. If anyone was caught overworking, the manager would be notified and could reprimand that person. Clever, right? Well, here's what the employees at the company did. All of them but one would go clock out in the afternoon at the correct time, but would then sneak back to their desks and keep working. At a much later hour, all of them would meet at the exit and at the same time, and the last person would swipe out so the doors opened and all of them would leave. Now, they rotated the late worker so they could take turns getting in trouble for it. That is an extreme example, but there are many ways we can play into this. For instance, while many U.S. workers get very little vacation time, a lot of them don't even take all the days off they can. 65% of U.S. workers did not take all the vacation days available to them in 2019. If you've been hoodwinked by the cult of overwork, it is no wonder. A lot of people have. I fell into that trap and had to essentially deprogram myself in my early 30s. I graduated from university with a master's in computer science and said to myself, yes, time to build a career. I moved to a different city for a job uh, where I knew absolutely no one and had nothing going on but work, a lot of work. I hated it, moved to a new job in a new city where I also didn't know a soul so that my days were, you know, work, take out food and TV and way too much of each of those. After a couple of years of this, I suddenly had a realization. Yeah, I was making good money and my career was off to a promising start, but I was also lonely, overweight, unhealthy, and unhappy. 
Right then, I decided to make a change. I scaled back on work, got in shape, and started to make friends. Um, a couple of years later, when I got the chance, I co-founded my own tech company where we outlawed overwork. So what I'm saying is that you can start with yourself. Recognize that all that overwork is just not worth it and find ways around it. Here are some things you can do. First, don't take a job in a workplace that's part of the cult. How can you tell? Well, some people say that you can decode the job ad. Fast-paced? Understaffed. Work hard, play hard? You're going to work 60 hours a week, so you better squeeze what you can out of your time off. Also, the CEO is a triathlete. We're looking for a rock star. We want you to pretend you love working our unreasonable hours. But in reality, you'll probably have to talk to the people there and ask them about it directly. One thing that works in your favor is that people in workplaces with a strong culture of overwork are often proud of it and will actually brag about all that work, giving you a great chance to steer clear. Second, if you are currently overworked, find ways to scale back. It's probably not in your contract that you must work 80 hours a week. In most countries, that would be illegal. And this, by the way, can be really insidious because when overwork is not contractually required, it means that it's something you're doing to yourself, not something done to you by others. When other people do bad things to us, it's easier to resist them. When we do them to ourselves, we often end up rationalizing our actions and making up reasons for why we're doing it and why this is fine. So scale back. I am willing to bet that you, like so many others, will find that you get just as much work done in 40 hours a week as everybody else does in 60, 70, or 80. And if your company won't let you scale back, then quitting is absolutely an option. Hey, let's try something fun. Let's do a Google image search for Quitting is an option. Alrighty, let's see what we got. Uh, quitting is not an option. Oh, quitting is an option. Good one. Quitting is not an option. Not an option. Not an option. Not an option. And this is probably my favorite. Crawling is acceptable. Falling, puking, crying, blood, pain. But quitting is not an option. Huh. It's almost like there is a widespread belief that quitting is bad. I'm planning an entire video similar to this one on quitting. Uh, subscribe if you don't want to miss that one. And, and seriously, if you're stuck in a workplace that rewards work hours over work quality, get the hell out of Dodge and find a workplace that hasn't got its head stuck up its ass. There are plenty of them. And finally, here's a piece of bad advice you should absolutely ignore. Some people say, don't like your job too much, it'll make you work too hard. That is nonsense. Most of the workaholics I know don't overwork because they like their jobs. It's almost the opposite. They hate their jobs, so they have to work hard to get those raises and bonuses and promotions, or their work lives would be completely pointless. And as long as we're bringing the work hours down anyway, why stop at 40? It's not like 40 is a magical number. It mostly came out of a campaign in the early 20th century to get workers 8 hours of sleep, 8 hours of work, and 8 hours of free time. Can we go lower? Hell yeah! Toyota Center Gothenburg had a problem 15 years ago. Their business was growing rapidly and they needed more repair base in the shop where mechanics could work on the cars. Basically, all of their bays were completely booked from 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, whole workday, and building more bays would have been very expensive. They could have asked their mechanics to work longer hours to service more customers, uh, fix more cars, but instead they did the opposite and moved all of their car mechanics to a 30-hour work week. Instead of expanding the space, they expanded the time. Using the same number of bays, they divided their mechanics into two six-hour shifts. Before they all worked from eight to four, 
Now half of them work from six in the morning till noon and the other half from noon to six in the evening. This comes out to 30 hours per week uh, instead of 40, but they have all kept their original monthly salaries. And here's the kicker. They now get more work done in a six hour shift than they previously did in an eight hour shift. Customers are happier because the company is now open 12 hours a day instead of eight, meaning they can more easily bring in or pick up their cars before or after work. Uh, their mechanics are happier because they're working fewer hours, but work more productively, which feels amazing. But wait, there's more. Mechanics now have a nice chunk of free time every day, either before or after midday, which makes their lives go easier. Also, their commutes go much smoother and faster because they are not going to and from work in rush hour traffic. Um, when their CEO, Martin, presented about this at a conference I arranged back in 2018, his presentation included a slide called Drawbacks, listing all the disadvantages of the shorter hours. This was the slide. Yep, there weren't any drawbacks. He just felt like he should include a slide on him. Some companies went below 40 hours by accident. In her excellent book, The Time Bind, American sociologist Ali Hochschild shared the story of a company that was forced to try it when their revenue suddenly dropped. When demand for a product is down, normally a company fires some people and makes the rest work twice as hard. So we put it to a vote of everyone in the plant. We asked them what they wanted to do. Layoffs for some workers or 32 hour work weeks for everyone. They thought about it and decided they'd rather hold the team together. So we went down to 32 hour a week schedule for everyone during the downtime. We took everybody's hours and salary down, executives too. But when they did that, there were two things that really surprised them. First, productivity did not decline. I swear to God, we get as much out of them at 32 hours as we did at 40. So it's not a bad business decision. But second, when economic conditions improved, we offered them 100% time again. No one wanted to go back. Never in our wildest dreams would our managers have designed a four day week. But it's endured at the insistence of our employees. And some companies get there by design. IIH Nordic is a digital agency based right here in Copenhagen, where I live. And back in 2017, they switched to a four day, 30 hour work week for all their employees with no reduction in salary. So they all work regular hours now, Monday to Thursday, and then everybody has Friday off to do things that increase their quality of life. I've been there, uh, I've been to their offices a few times and I've talked to their CEO, Henrik uh, Steinman, about this. And I think the most important thing he says is that it's not enough to just reduce hours. At the same time, they also had to find ways to optimize their work time. For instance, by having fewer and shorter meetings, uh, by minimizing interruptions and by changing their email habits. And while all of these changes took a lot of effort and thought, he also could not be prouder of the results they've achieved. Um, absenteeism and employee turnover are down, while employee happiness, customer satisfaction, and yes, profits are up. Now, I honestly don't think that companies can abolish overwork completely. No workplace has a perfectly predictable workload and there are definitely situations where employees can help their coworkers, the customers or the business by working longer hours. Um, let's say a team of doctors and nurses are operating on you and for whatever reason the operation takes longer than expected and it's now past the time when their shift ends. I, I'm just guessing here, but I'm, I assume you'd want them to finish the procedure rather than just the, drop the scalpel right then and there and, and head on home. But whenever we do have overwork, it should live up to these eight principles. It should be voluntary so that people can opt in if they want to or opt out if it doesn't fit into their responsibilities outside of work. Also, no one must be punished or marginalized for saying no to overwork. 
it should be rare so that it's not a constant pressure on people. Constant overwork is a sign of terrible planning and not caring about staff. It should be temporary and only last for a few days at most. It should be meaningful. Whatever it is we're working longer hours than normal to achieve should be clearly helping somebody who needs it. It should be equitable so employees get compensated fairly for the extra effort and either get paid more or get time off later. It should be appreciated so the company shows that the extra effort is valued and welcome and not just taken for granted. It should be enjoyable. Overwork should not be a death march. It should be fun. And it should be distributed evenly so it's not always the same few people having to work longer hours. It's super easy to remember these eight principles because if you rearrange the first letters, it spells remade TV. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I hate models that spell something. Whenever I see one, I always suspect that people have added extra stuff to the model just to get, to get it to spell something cool. Um, in the future, whenever you see a model that spells something, I want you to automatically mistrust it. Um, for this one, I, I had to use an anagram generator to come up with remade TV. Um, alternatives included tamed rev and armed vet. A lot of people also say that permanent overwork is fine under two conditions. Either if you love what you do or if you're doing very important work. I disagree completely. If you truly love your work, you can definitely sustain 70-hour work weeks longer, but not forever. It is going to wear you down eventually. And as for the meaningful work, when I asked my Facebook friends to complete the following sentence, working 60 hours a week is, a lot of the replies were, were negative because I have great Facebook friends. Uh, but one person said they hoped that the people designing and making COVID vaccines were working, you know, long hours. And and I can understand that. I personally can't wait to get vaccinated myself and, you know, get the, the Denmark out of these damn lockdowns, which definitely work. Don't let the COVID idiots tell you otherwise. But, you know, if we want the vaccines as quickly as possible, we should let the workers work as productively as possible. And that's not 60 hours a week. The science is super clear on that. If I have seemed a little sarcastic in this video, it's because the cult of overwork honestly offends me. It offends me because it hurts people, but even more so because it hurts people in a way that is just utterly pointless and dumb. It's, it's just one of several nonsensical myths thoroughly debunked by evidence that is actively hurting people while perpetuating many types of inequality. And, and some workplaces just require you to believe this and live by it. Let me be clear. I couldn't possibly care less if Jack Ma works 996 or if Michael Bloomberg wears adult diapers so he doesn't have to take bathroom breaks. And I really, really don't care if they think that's what made them rich. If that's what they need to tell themselves to feel good about all those hours they worked, let them. But they don't stop there, do they? They also do everything they can to fool the rest of us into believing that 80 hour weeks are the only way to success while at the same time designing their companies to make sure that it's true there. And that's not even the worst part. To make matters worse, they sell overwork not just as something necessary, but as something noble, nearly heroic. As if being willing to sacrifice all other areas of your life to your career somehow means you're more disciplined, stronger, more valuable, or a better person. It doesn't. What it really means is that you're gullible, conformist, and willing to let other people decide how you live your life. But what do you think? How long do you think the typical work week should be? Have you broken out of the cult of overwork? Or am I a goddamn radical postmodern neo-Marxist for denying the inherent nobility of the 80-hour work week? Please write a comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions. Because here's the thing, we need to switch our thinking. Permanent overwork is not noble, it's pointless.
Overwork is not a sign of commitment to a workplace. It's a sign that this workplace sucks at planning and doesn't give a damn about its people. The massive gains in productivity and wealth we have seen in wealthy nations have not come because of all those extra work hours, but in spite of them. And we can fix it. We are fixing it. And as we do, we create even more wealth, not to mention better and happier lives, by working fewer hours. This even benefits company owners. Remember how workers and unions during the Industrial Revolution campaigned for humane working conditions and factory owners fought them every step of the way because they claimed there was just no way they could stay in business if they couldn't work people to death for almost no money? Well, here's what happened when they were finally forced, kicking and screaming, to lower working hours output actually increased and expensive mistakes and accidents decreased. Sure, you could go along with this bullshit belief and in some workplaces it might even pay off. It might. But if you do that, you will be hurting your health, your family and your happiness. And even worse, you will be actively working to prop up a system that you know is bullshit. Don't do it. Because, as Lily Tomlin said, the trouble with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Stay happy. I want to mention two more reasons why the cult of overwork is still around, even it's even blah, 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 blah. <laughs> when the managers are true believers, they of course only promote other workaholics to management positions. And anyone who had want, <laughs> while of course expecting the remaining blah, 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 if you want to know more about universal basic income, that's a whole blah, 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 blah. <laughs> universal basic income is a whole topic in itself. I'll link to some great video. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Basically, it serves... There's, uh, <clears throat> there's another... My hat keeps falling off. <laughs> There's another theory that governments blah 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 blah